This Ferrari is fancy enough that the higher-ups of Kelly Blue Book have asked me to dress up to review it. So while I do that, enjoy the voiceover. Uh, let's see. The GTC4 Lusso is a speedy, ultra-luxe grand touring car that picks up where the Ferrari FF left off. Its two-door shooting brake body style houses four seats and, presumably, room for their occupant stuff. Assuming I look presentable, let's go prance this horse around California's fake Italian coastline. Hmm, Palos Verdes. Coastal, affluent, sunny. This will do just fine. Okay, let's talk Lusso. The original clumsily titled GTC4 Lusso rocks a 681 horsepower naturally aspirated 6.3 liter V12, a 7 speed dual clutch transmission, all wheel steering, and a clever lightweight 2 speed gearbox with torque vectoring abilities to direct power to the appropriate front tire. According to Ferrari, the V12 Lusso springs from static to 62 miles per hour in 3.4 seconds, onward to a 208 mile per hour top speed. Fun! This, however, is the GTC4 Lusso T. That T indicates the presence of a 3.9 liter turbocharged flat plane V8. Into the back of those cars! I'm just kidding. With an 80 horsepower deficit and no fancy all wheel drive like the regular Lusso, you might be tempted to pity the T. But as any child of the 80s will tell you, Mr. T pities you. With that strained wordplay out of the way, let's see how the GTC4 Lusso T fares as a grand tour. To help me do that, I'm going to recruit my car reviewer friend, Lynn. Hey, Lynn, do you want to drive a Ferrari Lusso GTC4 while I review the back seat? Uh, is the Pope Catholic, Micah? Yeah. Bye. So, Micah, mm -hmm. I happen to know a great fake Italian road on which we can tour. What do you say we tour? Let's grand tour it. Fantastic. Even though the Lusso GTC is a grand touring car, it has a top speed of 199 miles an hour, which means it's fast. The visibility, I'm not going to say is phenomenal, but it's, it's a Ferrari. They don't like you looking in the back. That's why they usually put the engine back there. That's right. To be clear, the, we know the engine is in the front, attentive YouTube commenters. I will say that the roof is amazing. I'm enjoying it. I like it. It's I massive. just think it doesn't make you feel like you're actually in the fishbowl that you're in. It's but it's marvelous. Would you like to know how it is here in the back seat? I can report that from the back seat there is excellent headroom. Legroom is great too, but then Lynn has the seat in the Lynn position, which is way up there. I can verify that sitting behind myself, my legs would be very cramped. It's kind of like if you get on Space Mountain and how your lower section can't move, but you're totally okay with that because it's right for the context. All that said, uh, can I move up to the front seat, please? That one? Yeah. Never. The MagnaRide SCM electronic dampers aren't exactly soft, but there is a bumpy road suspension setting, which makes things a little bit more comfortable. You know, even in sport mode, Ferrari didn't tune the Lusso like a track car. And while you can feel the road underneath you, it's not violent and no one's going to need to go to the chiropractor after a drive. Whatever your aesthetic thoughts, the Luso's hatchback profile is a boon for cargo space, as are folding rear seats, helping make this the most practical of Ferraris. Elsewhere, the Luso's cabin exudes decadent authenticity with stitched leather everything and real metal elements, including a passenger footrest, this armrest hinge, and a nifty flippable cup holder. There's also a personal spec plate located inside the rear hatch, reminding you that this is not just a Ferrari, but rather your Ferrari. And like all Ferraris, from the driver's seat, there's not a stock in sight. All essential controls have been squeezed onto the steering wheel, including the starter, Manatino drive mode selector, wiper controls, and separate left and right turn signals. The Ferrari Lusso isn't the first car to sport a dual cockpit design, but it takes that concept further than most by adding a little screen to help keep the front passenger engaged. Honestly, I'm not sure how valuable it is to access media and navigation functions here instead of right here, but I can watch the performance and VDA information, which is really convenient for keeping tabs on Lynn while she drives, because my name is on the loan, Lynn. So I have a right seat driver now instead of a back seat driver? Yes, you do.
now that I'm thankfully in the driver's seat, I will point out that the dual clutch seven speed transmission is as rapid with the shifts as you would hope. Oh, that is nice. Upshift, upshift. And yet, when you have it in auto mode and you're just humming right along, utterly smooth. Wait a second, you said thankfully in the driver's seat. What does that say about my driving? Oh, hey, look, a dam. <laughs> Oh good, a really tight corner. This is a great opportunity to try out the four-wheel steering. Let's see if it feels agile. <laughs> the great thing about the four-wheel steering system is that it uh, gives a theoretically shorter wheelbase in tight corners, and then on the freeway, the rear wheels turn in the same direction as the front, so you get these really stable lane changes. Uh, I think the system works pretty darn well. Hey, Lynn, would you like to see how launch control works? Yes, I would. PS button, ESC off. Left foot on brake, right foot planted, left foot off. Ah! Upshift. Upshift. Huh, it's pretty quick. Yeah, the V8's just fine, right? You're not saying, like, ah, oh, I wish there was a V12 powering no, this thing. No, no. What about the sound? I think the sound is actually pretty decent for a V8. Better than the 12? No. Nothing's better than the 12. Oh, I can't top that opinion. No. That's the correct opinion. One more quick note about the transmission. When you're cruising along, when you floor it, sometimes it takes a little while for the transmission to make the right downshift and for boost to engage, which is not how boost works, but the power to come on and get that accelerative force. So, pro tip, if you'd like to go fast and you know it's coming up soon, downshift in advance. That worked pretty well. There's a lot to like about the Luso, but we should discuss price including a gas guzzler tax and destination charges, a base Ferrari GTC4 Lusso T costs almost $270,000. As tested, $333,080. That nearly $60,000 price jump comes via a panoramic roof, a front camera system, 128 gigabytes of infotainment storage, and Apple CarPlay, a normally free feature that costs a cool $4,219. No, I did not misspeak. Put another way, the GTC4 Lusso T is objectively expensive, but Ferrari buyers objectively do not care. So which Lusso should you buy? Well, the V12 costs about $40,000 more than the V8, but that fee brings with it the oral and accelerative delights of a V12 along with all-wheel drive, making it the right car for Ferrari buyers who drive in the snow. If you're the kind of Ferrari driver who actually drives in the snow, please send me a picture on Instagram. Wait, I want a graphic too. Fine. Uh, that's actually a pretty nice graphic. Snow-loving V12 fanatics know which Lusso to buy, but for more grounded Ferrari shoppers, the GTC4 Lusso T could be the superior choice. Merging rear drive agility and a powerhouse V8 with sultan-worthy trappings inside and out, the Lusso T is a truly excellent grand touring machine. As a bonus, the T's lower base price frees up funds for the option sheet. If I wanted a Ferrari to escape my wife and child, it would be the 488 GTB. But if I wanted to bring them with me, the GTC4 Lusso T is the Ferrari I would buy. Lynn, what do you think? It's an absolute looker. It's exciting to drive because, well, it is a Ferrari. And it's a wagon, which means the Lusso GTC4 is the tiniest slice on the Venn diagram that intersects excess and practicality. So will you take a personal check for it? Yeah. Hey, I think that's the end of the video. Can I have the keys back? Okay. Thank you. Do you want to ride? Yeah. <laughs>